Okay, so now we are at the Metabolism and Energetics Lecture. Um, as I've said before, this unit is basically digestion and metabolism. And if you sort of think about them in broad strokes, digestion, of course, is, as we discussed, how you um, how your body acquires nutrients that it needs to thrive and survive, essentially. Um, and once those nutrients are acquired, what do we do with them? How do we, how are they utilized? And that's what this chapter is about. How do we once these nutrients are acquired in the system through the digestive pathway as we talked about, how do we utilize them? And so um, what some of the general terms we're going to talk about obviously in the end of the chapter is metabolism and energetics. And what does metabolism mean? That may be a term you're not you probably heard a lot, but you may not ex be exactly sure what metabolism means. It's sort of this large term that you hear for generally uh, a lot of types of activities in the body. But essentially metabolism or metabolic activity is just pretty much any cellular activity. So when your muscle contracts, that's metabolic activity. When your cells form and produce ATP, that's metabolic activity. When they produce proteins or neurotransmitters, that's all metabolic activity. So all these things collect and sort of this umbrella term for cellular activity inside the body is metabolism. So that's one thing we're going to talk about is what do we do with the stuff that we're acquiring? So metabolic activity, cells break down these things, these nutrients that we require to obtain energy, uh, and they're used obviously to generate ATP as we talked about in the back at AMP1 and obviously most energy production. This is going to occur in the mitochondria, right? Mitochondria take sugar or fat feed it into the cell with oxygen, into the mitochondria with oxygen, uh, and produce ATP. And so ATP is what's used to for a lot of activities, you know, in the body that any any sort of um, you know powerhouse of the cell type of activity. That's what we're talking about collectively when we look at uh, ATP production. So what are these things? Well primarily you're talking about oxygen of course, water nutrients, these are all body chemicals that are utilized to manufacture ATP and to, you know, conduct metabolism. The nutrients can be obviously sugar and fat, like I mentioned, the proteins, the vitamins and organic components, etc. All those are part of that. And so these body chemicals are carried through the cardiovascular system, right? So when we digest things, we, we ingest something that has sugar and fat and protein. Essentially these are going into the to the um, bloodstream, right, into the cardiovascular system, of course, and the blood carries these materials throughout the body. The materials arrive at all the targets throughout the body and the cells, and they're diffused from the bloodstream into the cells, and the cells can then utilize them. And that's sort of what we'll look at when we talk about it. And so energetics, then, if metabolism is, is you know, all these cellular processes and activities, Energetics is the flow of energy and its changes and how it changes and what happens to it. Um, so again, metabolism is all these chemical reactions inside component, and so the cellular metabolism is just looking at all chemical reactions within cells. And the cellular metabolism occurs to provide energy, but also to form homeostasis and maintain bodily functions. Uh, and so these essential functions of metabolism, of course, are metabolic turnover, which is just cell replacement of components of the cell, uh, growth and cell division, of course, is required or is, is an essential you know, function of metabolism, uh, and then secretion, contraction, propagation of action potentials. All that is, again, sort of this large umbrella term referring to uh, metabolism. Okay? Um, so the nutrient pool, nutrients that are used, uh, are essentially everything the cell needs, right? That's why we need to acquire these nutrients. And the cells can be utilized to produce energy, right, in the form of ATP, or they can be used to repair and create new cellular components. And so you have these two pathways that you can utilize these nutrient pools for. You can use it for what we call catabolism or anabolism. Okay, and so that's sort of what we're going to look at when we talk about either providing energy for the cell or creating new cellular components. Those are sort of the two components. And so catabolism is the breakdown of these components to essentially create 
ATP, right? And so we use these nutrients, feed them into the cell, produce energy so the cell can work. And so that's what catabolism refers to. And so we think of that as sort of a downhill process, right, where you're breaking things down further and further uh, into the met uh, mitochondria to produce uh, energy for the cell. That's generally what we're going to see with the catabolic activities that break down of these components. Anabolism is actually more of the other direction. We call that sort of an uphill process that forms new chemical bonds and, and produces proteins and other types of components. Uh, and so we see the synthesis of new organic molecules, right? So catabolism is breaking things down to produce energy. Anabolism is going the other direction to form proteins, repair cells, other types of activities that we might see. So those are the two sort of end of uh, metabolism. And so this slide shows nicely what we're talking about. And so if you look at, let me get a little quick get a marker up here. Okay. Um, so if you look at this whole process, it's really interesting to see how it works. So this image is nice because it shows just the entire cell, right? So this is just any given cell, what's happening in a cell. So you can see the plasma membrane, this is outside the cell here, this is of course inside the cell. And so first thing that happens, of course, are these organic molecules as a result of digestion are delivered to the cell, right? So proteins, fats, and sugar, right? That's when you look inside of a label of a box of food that you eat, you can have proteins, fat, and sugar in terms of the, the quantity of those things. So those things we ingest, they're broken down, of course, as we saw in the digestive pathway, enter the bloodstream, and then travel to the cells, right? And so that's how they then enter the cell. The nutrient pool enters into the cell. And as we said, there are two sort of ends for this nutrient pool. You have the anabolic pathway, which we said is more of an uphill um, component, and you have a catabolic pathway, which is more, as we said, a downhill pathway. Okay? And so you take this nutrient pool, and those are your two ends. Okay, for anabolic results of anabolism, things like, as I said, maintenance and repair, growth, secretion, uh, maybe storing and preserving nutrients, all those types of things are going to be the result of the anabolic pathway. Catabolic pathway is ultimately going to be uh, the production of ATP, right? And so you use these nutrient resources, primarily sugar and fat, to either do anaerobic catabolism uh, inside the cell to produce smaller amounts of ATP, or again, what is the more common use and form of ATP is aerobic metabolism. As you can see, you get ATP, and that ATP can be used to help with anabolism, but it also, of course, can be used for like locomotion or contraction of skeletal muscle. Obviously, we saw that. Uh, endocytosis, exocytosis, cellular transport, all these things require ATP. So you have these two sort of ends that we're going to be using. Now, another thing that's really interesting and that you want to make note of, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, is that 60% um, of all this act of this catabolic activity, 40% of it's producing ATP, but 60% of it is producing heat. Right? And so that's the byproduct. So that's why I always say people have like a higher metabolic activity, right? They're going to be warmer, have, you know, maybe a higher resting body temperature um, than others that don't have as much metabolic activity. If you recall, when we talked about thyroid, for instance, we talked about hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroid gland in general, if you recall, basically helps regulate these metabolic processes and keep them in check so that you have enough metabolic activity. So if you have not enough thyroid hormone, right, at like T3 and T4, you're going to see a drop in metabolic activity. And so one of the effects of someone who has hypothyroidism is maybe lethargic, not having a lot of energy, not maybe feeling cool all the time, right, because they're not having enough metabolic activity. We said the effect of hyperthyroidism would be over metabolic activity, right? So you might feel restless. Um, and the sweat might be producing too much body heat, right, because of an excess of an excess uh, metabolic activity. So we can sort of try this what we talked about with the thyroid gland um, and uh, take a look at that. So anyway, um, this is a nice slide sort of summarizing a lot of the sort of ends uh, of cellular metabolism and what that really sort of is all about. All right? All right, so... Reasons for anabolism, as we said, 
um, maintenance and repair, support growth, secretory products, and storage of nutrient reserves, right? We talk, talked about that back when we looked at skeletal muscle, right? Your muscle has the ability, for instance, to take sugar, excess sugar, and if it can't use it to produce ATP, which is a catabolic pathway, it can take it and store it as glycogen, which would be an anabolic pathway, right? A building up as opposed to breaking down. So those are some of the things we're going to see um, with anabolism, right? And so as we said, storage of nutrient reserves, there are different ways. Glycogen, I already talked about that, right? It's the, it's the way sugar is stored. Triglycerides are primarily the way fat is stored. And proteins um, are really the most abundant component you're going to see in the body, and they can, they'll contribute to many cellular functions. So proteins are uh, typically uh, high for the nutrient reserve component. And then so here's another slide, just sort of again, sort of a similar thing, showing how nutrients are utilized. And we kind of already talked about this, but you know, again, this is inside the cell, this is outside the cell, and then you have these things that you absorb into the diet, into the bloodstream, nutrient pools delivered to the cell. And so what happens with these components? Again, we said we have fat, sugar, and proteins. And so what typically happens? Well, in blue here, we're representing anabolic activities. And in red here, we're representing catabolic pathways. And so as you can see, um, you know, fat is stored, as we said, as triglyceride. Um, glycogen, or excuse me, sugar is stored as glucose, and then amino acids form protein. But if you could look, they show the, the arrows have different sizes, right? Most of what's happening with protein is anabolism. As we're going to see, and you can see there's a much thinner arrow for catabolism of proteins because it's not used as much as an energy source. And we're going to talk about reasons why that is a little bit later. The proteins primarily serve the purpose and the function of anabolic pathways. You can represent it there by that larger arrow. If you look at fat and sugar, again, we have you know a, a nice quantity of those ultimately fit, being fed into the mitochondria to produce ATP. And the, again, heat is also sort of going to be given off uh, in that process. All right? And then CO2, of course, as you guys know, is the byproduct of that activity, of that metabolic activity of the mitochondria. All right, so um, that gives us a nice background of metabolism and catabolic and anabolic pathways to make sure you have a good understanding of that. And so what we want to do now is we want to start looking at what are these uh, components? Uh, how are they used? So how is sugar used? What is the metabolic end of carbohydrates? What about fat? What is the metabolic end of, of fat? What about proteins? What happens with those? And get a feel for what's going with these, with these different um, you know, sort of nutrient sources and the nutrient pool that we talked about. And so sugar or carbo carbohydrate metabolism, um, again, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, is used either to store, uh, you know, as, as glucose, but more significantly from a catabolic pathway to generate ATP, right? And so it takes these sugars or uh, glucose and ultimately produces uh, ATP, and there are two ways. Of course, you guys know this: aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic is also referred to glycolysis, and is done without oxygen and pr produced in the cytosol itself, but not giving you off a whole lot of ATP. Aerobic is with oxygen; ATP production occurs in the mitochondria, and giving you a much higher quantity of ATP. Where here we have much lower ATP. I'll turn it right then out here. Well, it's hard to do. A, T, P. But you guys know this by now. But anyway, I uh, just sort of wanted to quickly review that uh, in terms of what happens with, with sugar from a catabolic standpoint. And so glycolysis, as we know, does not require oxygen. As I mentioned, uh, basically breaks down six carbon glucose into two, three carbon molecules of pyruvate. Ultimately, the net result is about two ATP for each. And again, is, that, of course, is much less efficient when compared with aerobic metabolism. Okay? And so you can see what happens here in glycolysis. You have this um, you know, six-chain glucose that we can see in this image right here being broken down ultimately into these components. Uh, and as the pathway continues, you can see the steps in glycolysis that are ultimately going to lead to 2 ATP. So you don't need to know 
all of these steps. That really is more of an intro to biology or microbiology topic. I know you guys have already taken that. So I generally just want you to have a snapshot of, of what's happening um, with glycolysis and, and, and the, you know, the processes that are occurring. So if you can use this slide as well as the previous one, you should be in good shape for that uh, information. All right, now what about mitochondrial production uh, of ATP, right? And so if the oxygen supplies to the muscle, for instance, are adequate, the mitochondria produces ATP. And as you guys know, there's a citric acid cycle and electron transport chain or system uh, that produces this ATP. And so the energy yield from this component uh, begins with sugar, ends with CO2, and is the main method for generating ATP, as I mentioned. So um, initially, glycolysis typically occurs as sort of the first reaction before uh, aerobic metabolism occurs in the mitochondria. And as you can see, you get that net gain of two ATP, but then goes through a transition phase where these two molecules of NADH pass electrons to FAD, uh, and ultimately you're getting producing an additional eight, four ATP molecules, uh, and then the electron transport chain or system uh, ultimately produces um, the remainder of the ATP, and so you end up with a, a significant amount of ATP. And so the citric acid cycle also produces two ATP. Um, in this process. And so again, you don't have to go into all the specifics, um, but this summary slide is pretty much what you want to be able to do, right? Two, coming from glycolysis. Um, four, from the NADH that's producing glycolysis. Two, from the citric acid cycle. And then finally, 28, from the electron transport chain or system. And that's ultimately where you're getting a higher amount of ATP, right? And so that's what we're ultimately working on here is that 36 that uh, you get total ATP production from, uh, you know, mitochondrial ATP production, right? Okay. Uh, and so that's where that's coming from. And so this sort of shows ultimately all those steps. And of course, this is occurring inside the mitochondria, which you can see right here. And we have the citric acid cycle, and we also have the electron transport system. And so it sort of summarizes where those are all coming from. So this is a nice slide. Uh, to to understand how that works. Now again, you don't need to know all the exact steps in terms of coenzyme A and pseudo CoA and all that kind of stuff. But you should generally, like in this previous slide, have a nice understanding of of what we're getting from mitochondrial production and how it's working in the different components. You know, the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain your system and how those generally work. All right, and so that's what you're getting net gain: 36 ATP from catabolism of one. Uh, glucose mo uh, molecule. Now, another thing that's very interesting about carbohydrate, carbohydrate metabolism is what's called gluconeogenesis, which is the synthesis of glucose from not from sugar, like lactic acid or glycerol, amino acids. Um, and this is the way, you know, the liver, for instance, has the ability to manufacture um, some sugar if, if, if if it's needed and required. But again, glucose is stored as glycogen in the liver and skeletal muscle, and that would only be uh, gluconeogenesis in, in um, formation of that. And so you have glycogenesis, which is a formation of glycogen, as I said, from glucose, um, and requires UTPA, or excuse me, UTP. Um, but Ultimately, it occurs pretty slowly, uh, and that process of then converting it back to sugar occurs pretty quickly so that your body can have that sugar uh, easily to produce ATP, right? Break down glycogen. So, glycogenesis is the formation of the storage form of glucose. Glycogenolysis is the breakdown of that glycogen so the body can use it, right? And so, you have to be able to go sort of both directions with that. And that, you can see that here, right? In this section right here. You have the sugar either going into glycogen, right, or glycogen being converted back into sugar. And so that's an important step that happens uh, ultimately inside the cytosol, right? And so this just shows a little bit closer use of ultimately those, those gains and how the um, cell is utilizing the sugar to produce uh, ATP. All right? So that is... Carbohydrate metabolism, sort of a brief snapshot of what is occurring there. Lipid metabolism, a little bit different. 
Um, lipid molecules also can contain these components, but sort of in different proportions that we see with carbohydrates and triglycerides are the most sort of abundant sort of storage form of lipid that we see in the body. And so lipid catabolism or lipolysis is essentially the breakdown of lipids uh, ultimately into pieces that are components that can be converted and ultimately channeled directly into the citric acid cycle and the mitochondria where that can ultimately put, uh, be, you know, formation of ATP can occur. Um, hydrolysis essentially splits, splits that triglyceride into its parts. Uh, and then ultimately can then be utilized inside the cell to produce ATP. Um, enzymes in the cell convert the glycerol to pruvic acid. Pruvic acid, of course, enters the CTA cycle. Uh, and then different enzymes can convert these fatty acids into acetyl-CoA, and we call that process uh, beta-oxidation. Okay, so that's ultimately what we refer to as this series of reactions that breaks down lipid into its components so it can be more easily converted uh, into ATP. So beta oxidation then is a series of reactions that basically, again, takes fat and converts it into easier, uh, more, you know, usable uh, components that the mitochondria can, can uh, utilize. And so that occurs inside the mitochondria. Um, and so you can see all the steps that happen here. Um, again, this is inside the cell. Here's your triglyceride. Once it's inside the cell, again, it's going to be broken down into smaller components, smaller and smaller until it can be fed into the mitochondria, go through the citric acid cycle, ultimately producing um, ATP. Okay? So lipid and energy production, it's sort of like comparing, you know, apples to oranges, so to speak, where you have for each two carbon fragment, you know, you're going to get about 12 ATP and 5 ATP. So a cell can gain, um, you know, 144 ATP from the breakdown of an 18 carbon fatty acid molecule. So you're getting essentially about 1.5 times the energy gain as compared to sugar. But again, it's not the same amount, right? You have a larger fragment essentially that you're starting with. And so ultimately, you're getting a little more ATP uh, for lipid metabolism, okay? Um, Again, lipids can provide large amounts of ATP, but again, as you saw, the steps are a little more involved, and so lipids are stored in the cytosol, but a little more difficult for enzymes to access. So this is an important point that glucose is essentially the preferred form of energy production, like especially during exercise, right? Sugars are just easier to break down and for the cell to access to produce ATP. So that's something um, you know, that you, we sort of discussed briefly there when we were looking at lipid metabolism about all those steps involved and the more complex structure and how it's more difficult to break down. Um, and that's why glucose metabolism is really the preferred form of energy production. All right? So I know that's something you want to be aware of. Now, lipids are not soluble in water, right? And so they're not going to, you know, be as easily broken down as we saw. You know, bile is released from the liver to help with the breaking down and the multiplication of lipids. Um, and so most of these lipids circulate through the bloodstream, what are called lipoproteins. And so they need something to carry them, right? That's what these lipoproteins are transport mechanisms, essentially. Um, and so that's how they're moved around uh, throughout the body. Three fatty acids, you also you may have heard of those. These are a little bit easier to diffuse across the plasma membrane. Um, and so the, the three fatty acids are basically fatty acids that are not used in triglycerides, essentially, um, and ultimately used to, to help with you know, formation of ATP inside the cell. Uh, so these three fatty acids are an important cell, um, important energy source for the cell, excuse me. Um, so liver, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, all of these have the ability to metabolize free fatty acid, and we'll use that when glucose supplies are limited. So free fatty acids are uh, important as well. All right, so those, that's sugar and that's fat. The third sort of primary nutrient source as we talk about is protein, right? Protein. So we need to look at metabolism of protein and see what that's all about. As I said, you have two pathways for protein catabolism or anabolism. Anabolism is the primary 
end, um, you know, state of proteins. Okay, catabolism, you're not seeing that as much. It's not a preferred uh, component for the body. And so catabolism, or breakdown of proteins, goes through a few processes called transamination and deamination, whereas anabolism, which is the protein synthesis or formation of proteins and other components, um, goes through what's called animation and transamination as well. So we'll take a look at that. So again, just sort of a background on proteins. The body synthesizes hundreds and thousands of proteins, um, and these proteins are recycled and cytosolved, broken down, and ultimately used to form more proteins. And so typically the body wants to use sugar and fat for its catabolic pathways to produce ATP, right? But in a severe case where your nutrient sources are low, and other energy sources are inadequate, the mitochondria generate, it can generate ATP by breaking down amino acids, just like we saw fat and sugar. It's not as efficient, there's a less, you know, it's less beneficial, much more challenging process for the body. Uh, you get some more toxic uh, results of that, but it can use it if it needs it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. All right, so what happens uh, in amino acid Catabolism, again, the first step is sort of the breakdown or removal of the amino group. Uh, it's completed by transamination and requires this coenzyme um, from vitamin B6. To do that, um, the transamination attaches this amino group to what's called a keto acid, and the keto acid is then converted into an uh, amino acid, which enters, leaves the mitochondria, enters the cytosol, and inhales the protein synthesis. Uh, deamination then prepares that amino acid for breakdown, um, and what's really important is that it moves that uh, amino group and hydrogen atom, and the reaction of that process of deamination generates an ammonium ion. And this is what can be difficult and sort of toxic for the cell: is this generation of the ammonium ion. Until we talk about that. And so this just shows those processes of transamination and deamination. Again, I'm not going to have like a picture of this on the exam or something and have you fill everything in. Again, you just sort of in broad strokes and understand what's happening in these processes. And so this is deamination, as you can see, the ammonium ion is the byproduct of that. So, as I said, protein catabolism, breaking down proteins for energy source in this catabolic pathway is not preferred, right? It's not the way to go. The body's going to use sugar and fat as for the reason we talked about already. Um, and only will use proteins for catabolic pathways if sugar and fat are not available, essentially. And so there's three factors against this protein catabolism. Um, number one, as I said, proteins are more difficult to break apart than carbohydrates, especially, but even more so than lipids, right? Because carbohydrates are the easiest one. Lipids are a little bit harder. Uh, the proteins are before, by far the most difficult to break apart. As we said, the byproduct of this is ammonium. Ammonium can be toxic to the cell. The liver is going to have to handle this excess ammonium and can be, you know, difficult for the body to, to process. And then the last part, which is really important, as I said, the vast majority of the purpose of protein is to, you know, form these structural and functional components of cells. And so if you use all of your proteins for an energy source, right, you're going to threaten all of what those proteins need to help cells function, right? So very important that the body doesn't go to protein catabolism. And so that would only probably happen in the state of, you know, people are fasting or not eating enough sugars and other types of things uh, or fats in their diet and that the body has to then, of course, revert to proteins for this uh, breakdown. And so it can be, um, you know, as I said, harder to break down, toxic for cells, and then you're just removing all the proteins that are needed for all these cellular functions. Right? All right, so another important concept associated with amino acid catabolism is the generation of acetyl-CoA. We talked about that with lipids, but also more importantly with catabolism because if you have an increased concentration of acetyl-CoA, this is going to cause ketone bodies to form. Uh, when you have ketone bodies, there are three types. 
Um, but the problem is that's not as important. What's, what's important is that the liver does not catabolize these ketone bodies. And so um, the cells absorb these ketone bodies, and ultimately they're disassociated with solution, and the result is going to be ketosis, like fasting, for instance, right? If you get excess produ production of these cells, um, you get ketosis, which can cause severe problems. Um, and so ketonemia, then, is the appearance of these ketone bodies in the bloodstream. When you have these ketone bodies in the bloodstream, you're going to lower the plasma pH. Uh, ketoacidosis is when you have a very dangerous drop in pH caused by these ketone levels, and so uh, it can be very dangerous, could cause coma, cardiac arrhythmias, death, and so that's why um, eating a balanced diet is so important. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of, um, you know, when people do like uh, the Atkins diet or diets where they only eat protein, right? they don't eat a whole lot of sugar and fat. And this is one thing you have to really watch out for if you're not going to be getting a lot of sugar and fat is ketone bodies. And another component of that is also associated with, with diabetics. Diabetics can also, because their uh, circulating levels of sugars can fluctuate, um, they possibly can have some ketone levels increase and cause problems with the blood. So this is a, a, can be a significant uh, impact uh, on people's bodies. And again, so this sort of speaks to the, the reasoning why sort of this balanced diet of these different nutrients is important so your body is not relying on protein uh, for, uh, you know, an energy source and can utilize those proteins for other cellular functions, all right? All right, so protein synthesis then, that's the other direction, right? That's what we want to look at. And so uh, essential amino acids that come from the diet, uh, there are 10 of them, eight are not synthesized, and the other component is uh, insufficiently synthesized. Uh, these are essential amino acids. Uh, and so non-essential amino acids made by the body require this process called animation, which uses that ammonium ion. Uh, and so that's where you can see why it doesn't, you know, it's not as toxic for the cell when it's broken down, okay? Um, so that's pretty much it we want to talk about in terms of protein synthesis. Uh, but again, just bear in mind that's really the ultimate end you want with proteins is uh, using the anabolic pathway for protein. All right, so... Um, let's look then at absorptive and post-absorptive states and looking at, you know, nutrient requirements for each tissue and how that can vary depending on uh, what you're looking at. Um, there are primarily five metabolic tissues with different levels of these nutrient requirements. Um, you have liver, adipose, skeletal, neural, and other peripheral tissues that are important. Uh, the liver is essential. It's sort of the focal point of metabolic regulation, right? We talked about it sort of last time kind of being a filter, um, and it can, you know, utilize sugar, it can store sugar. Uh, hepatocytes, as you saw last time, have an extensive blood supply, and they can uh, monitor and adjust nutrient composition in that blood supply, right, of the blood that's passing through. And so, <laughs> again, for instance, if there's a, you're low on sugar, the liver has the ability to assess that and kick some sugar out into the bloodstream to help counteract the effect of that lower sugar. Now, again, it's going to be better to have a meal with has sugar in it to replace those levels, but the liver does have the ability to sort of counteract those effects to a certain degree. Uh, adipose tissue, of course, primarily starts in lipids as triglycerides, and we've seen adipose tissue, you guys know, it's in many locations, areolar, mesenteries, um, marrow, epicardium, uh, around the kidneys, these are all locations where we see uh, fat tissue. Uh, skeletal muscle, of course, as you know, um, has is made of proteins, but also has the ability to store sugar, as we've talked about. And the um, you know contractile proteins can be broken down. Uh, as I said, it's not the best pathway, but it, you know acids can be used as an energy source. But skeletal muscle, typically, wants those proteins to help build and repair muscle while using sugar and fat for. Uh, ATP formation. Um, neural tissue does not have the ability to store sugar or anything, um, and it needs only uses sugar as an uh, energy source 
uh, can't metabolize other molecules, so it needs a steady supply of sugar. And so the central nervous system obviously is not going to function very well when you have low sugar conditions. And so I'm sure we've all been there before when you have low blood sugar, but that sort of feels like in your brain. Uh, you, know, you might feel kind of funky and not be able to think as clearly. Um, you get the sugar back in your system, up to the brain, nervous tissue, and nervous tissue is going to work uh, much more efficiently because it's supply, you know, relying exclusively on that sugar. Okay? Um, all right, so another concept we want to talk about is metabolic rate. And this is another sort of concept you've probably heard of or at least talked about when someone says, oh, I have a fast metabolism or slow metabolism. Well, again, what does that mean exactly? And so, again, metabolic rates uh, just refers to, you know, what level of metabolic activity is, is, is happening inside your body, inside all of your cells. Okay, and so energy is released when you break chemical bonds, and in cells that energy is used to synthesize ATP, and we saw how some of that energy is lost as, as heat, right? And so when you produce heat, right? Uh, heat is obviously going to have an impact, and so that's where calories come in, right? Calorie really refers to the energy required to raise um, water by one degree Celsius, right? And we call that a calorie or a cal, and uh, not very practical measurement, so we, it's really actually one kilogram of water. Um, but we, again, generally we just refer to it as a calorie. And so basically, calories refer to you know, how much of this is needed to raise the temperature of food, of, of you know, of, of water, okay? And as you can see that in that, in that previous slide. And so, catabolism of food, breaking down food, is going to release energy. And so, lipids release about 9.46, roughly. Carbohydrates release 4. Proteins release 4, roughly, right? And so, most food is a mixture of these three components. Uh, and so that's where you get, you know, calories. How many calories does it have is in this food? Well, how much energy does it take to break down these components, right? Um, and so that's what we see when, we talk, when we're talking about calories, okay? And so met metabolism then can determine how much calorie is used, either per hour or per day, and that's what metabolic rate refers to. Generally, again, the sum of all processes, both anabolic and catabolic in the body, that ultimately leads to, um, you know, what, how much calories are you sort of quote unquote burning uh, as you're as you're doing a certain activity. So, calories again, you guys have probably all seen this before. Obviously, the more active you are, the more calories are going to be utilized, uh, sort of in in these activities. And so, resting versus slow walking, versus jogging, competitive you know, exercise, et cetera, you're going to see an increase in calories being expended during that time period. And so basal metabolic rate, or BMR, is, okay, what is your metabolic activity outside of exercise? What is just, what is happening just in that individual? And so it's sort of the minimum resting expend, expenditure of that person. Uh, and you can, you know, some researchers are able to actually measure resting metabolic rate, right? And so you can, um, energy utilization is typically proportional to oxygen consumption, right? Because oxygen is used in these metabolic reactions as we just described. Um, and so if you can measure oxygen consumption, that can give you an idea of someone's metabolic rate. And so they actually have like these hoods, glass sort of hoods that can measure oxygen consumption and that can give you an idea of um, what someone's resting metabolic activity is. And so metabolic rate is often oftentimes associated with um, you know energy demand. So if your energy intake exceeds what your body needs, right, the body's going to store this excess energy. If it exceeds dietary supply, it's going to use this. And so oftentimes there's this you know, weight-related discussion, right? If you have more calories, that's going to increase your rate. Less calories, you're going to lose weight. But as you can see, metabolic rate can play an impact. Because if you have a higher resting metabolic rate, you're going to be utilizing more energy, essentially, to for all that metabolic activity, and you'll be utilizing all those nutrient sources instead of storing them. Okay? Um, as I said, there are hormonal effects on overall um, metabolic rate. Uh, 
T3 and T4 are thyroid, uh, thyroid hormones in the body. Thyroxine also uh, is again controlling overall metabolic activity. So you can actually look at levels of T3 and T4, and that's what we were talking about with hyperthyroidism versus hypothyroidism. Uh, CCK, adrenal cord corticotropic hormone, ACTH, are also known to suppress appetite. Leptin is also released by uh, adipose tissue uh, and ultimately is an appetite suppressor, right? So they actually tried to study leptin to see if there's some way we could, you know, give someone a synthetic version of leptin. Would that make them less hungry then, right? It's released once your stomach is getting full of food. Um, and so that's something that was interesting to look at, but unfortunately it wasn't very promising in terms of trying to suppress that. Um, all right, so the next one I want to look at is what's called thermoregulation. Thermoregulation refers to essentially how we regulate our body temperature. And we talked about this way back uh, in um, AMP1. It was one of the first concepts we, we talked about. Uh, is how your body regulates its body temperature because again you're always producing heat even if you're not exercising right you there are metabolic processes going on inside your body and so they, you know, resting metabolic rate estimates the rate of energy use um, and so energy not captured is, re is released as heat and so that's what gives us sort of this body temperature and so there are different ways different homeostatic mechanisms to help maintain body temperature and so that's what thermoregulation is, right? And so how the body goes about doing this, there are different ways to try to either produce heat if it's needed or release heat if you need to try to cool down, right? And so that's generally what thermoregulation refers to. And so there are different ways heat exchange can, uh, heat that's produced can be exchanged with the environment, either radiation, convection, evaporation, or conduction. These are all ways in which we lose um, heat or heat transfer occurs. Radiation is just, you know, warm objects lose heat as what's called infrared radiation, right? just rating off an in, in individual. Uh, and that can, can be impacted by skin temperature and body temperature. Uh, and about 50% of indoor heat is lost as, as just radiation. Okay? So radiation is just heat rating off a body that's produced and from all this metabol metabolic activities. Convection is um, heat loss at the body surface, right? So it accounts for about 15% of, of indoor heat loss. Evaporation is one way the body tries to cool, right? Through either sweating, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. And then conduction is transfer of energy or heat through physical contact with someone. And this one is generally not as effective uh, as some of the other methods. And so this shows radiation, convection, evaporation, and conduction in terms of how our body can try to transfer heat and, and cool itself down. Now, as I said, water loss is a great way to try to maintain heat, right? Because heat is conducted very well in water. So when you lose water, your body's going to lose some heat. So that's why sweating is such an efficient way to try to cool yourself down. And so there's two types, and we talked about this before. There's insensible and sensible water loss or perspiration. Insensible water loss is basically just evaporation, essentially, right? We're losing fluid across. This is fluid loss not at sweat glands, just across the skin surface. And this is about 20%. So even if you're not exercising or not really active, you can dehydrate, right? Because you need to replace these fluids because you do have insensible water loss that occurs regularly. Sensible perspiration is the loss of fluid from sweat glands. So again, if you're more active, you're producing a lot of heat, your muscles are contracting, right? Your sweat glands are going to become active, try to lose water, heat's going to travel with the water, uh, and you'll pull yourself down. Okay? So, insensible and sensible perspiration. Now, heat gain and heat loss are also, you know, sort of processes, and essentially the hypothalamus is where our, our thermal regulatory center control is. Uh, and essentially, you achieve temperature by you know regulating the amount of heat that's produced, but also the heat that's lost to the to the environment, right? And so, as we said, when temperature exceeds the set point, the heat loss center is stimulated, right? If you're starting to get too hot, if you're exercising, or if you even if you have fever, right? You're going to try to cool yourself down a little bit, okay? And so, what happens in heat loss? Well, 
we see peripheral vasodilation, right? Where we get warm blood going closer to the skin surface, that's going to increase radiation and convection, or we lose heat that way. Sweat glands can also be stimulated to produce more sweat. Water is going to uh, move um, very well with heat. Uh, as, as heat is going to move very well with water, as I mentioned before. Perspiration flows across the um, body surface and you increase evaporation. Respiration can also help with cooling down. Depth of respiration typically increases. So that's what you're going to see uh, when you need to try to lose some heat. Right? And what about promoting heat gain the other direction? Right? Heat gain prevents low body temperature or hypothermia. Right? And so when the temperature drops, the heat loss center is going to be inhibited, of course, and then our heat gain center will be activated. Well, how can we try to gain heat? Right? How can we try to produce heat? Well, um, sympathetic vasomotor center decreases blood flow to the dermis, right? So we have less blood flow closer to the skin surface, more blood flow deeper in the body, and therefore we can reduce the amount of this loss through radiation and convection and conduction. Uh, and so in very cold conditions, blood flow to the skin is somewhat re restricted and trying to, again, channel that blood deeper into the, deeper into the body, okay? Um, heat exchange between these fluids, right, traps heat close to the body core and again restricts heat loss. And so that's what happens in heat conservation. Um, blood is diverted into a network of deep veins, right? Heat is conducted from warm blood flowing out there and we see cooler blood returning uh, from the periphery. So every, all these things are trying to help try to maintain temperature. Um, heat dissipation in warm conditions, right? The opposite thing is going to happen. Blood flow is going to increase to these superficial veins and heat will be conducted at the surface. And so these slides just sort of show the vascular adaptations and how things work depending on a warm environment uh, versus a cold environment. So just, again, a lot of it is vasodilation, vasoconstriction, which I, I know you guys are familiar with at this point. Um, it just makes you understand that those processes. All right? All right. Another way to generate heat is shivering, right? As we said, muscle contraction, skeletal muscle contraction produces a lot of heat, right? And so we shivering or shivering thermogenesis is a way we can produce heat. Increase muscle tone, increases energy consumption, skeletal muscle, which of course produces heat, right? And so shivering can increase heat generation up to 400%, right? Because large lot, you know, skeletal muscles contracting or producing heat, that's going to help raise your core temperature back up. So that's where shivering is. Um, Non-shivering thermogenesis, again, is just hormones that are going to try to increase metabolic activity. So other types of cells, other than skeletal muscle, are going to be increased in activity. And so we'll see... Um, you know, releasing epinephrine, for instance, the sympathetic division is going to raise metabolic activity and try to produce, uh, you know, increased activity of cells. And so epinephrine, for instance, is going to increase glycogenolysis, metabolic rate of most tissues are going to go up um, and can help raise body temperature. Now, what about hormones and, and thermogenesis in children? Low body temperature stimulates increase of TRH. You guys remember TRH from the pituitary gland. It, it stimulates the TSH to be released uh, and ultimately TSH stimulates the thyroid gland to release T3 and T4. That increases sugar catabolism and uh, rates going to go up. So that's kind of what I was talking about with the thyroid gland before and how it relates to um, you know, increase in temperature. Okay. Um, so, sources of thermoregulation can, can alter depending on the individual, depending on the age, their body size, et cetera, in terms of what's going on and how they adapt. So, body size, for instance, uh, heat produced by body mass, right? You're going to see a, a surface to volume ratio decrease, uh, but of course, heat generation is lost at the, at the bottom surface. So what that means is that, you know, certain individuals are going to lose heat quicker than others, um, but what it does mean is there's a problem that can be problematic for infants. And so we see temperature regulation 
um, of infants, they basically don't have these abilities. They can't shiver, uh, and so body temperatures can be less stable in infants. And so infants have what's called brown fat, which is highly vascularized adipose tissue. The adipocytes, you're going to find a lot of mitochondria. They're around the shoulder blades and the neck and the upper body. And so you can increase metabolic activity of this brown fat. And so that can produce some heat uh, to try to help maintain body temperature for infants. So um, function of brown fat, again, um, innovated by sympathetic autonomic fibers. And they're just increasing metabolic activity. The heat warms the blood. And the blood is in the of the body. And it can accelerate heat generation by about 100%. So again, they don't, infants do not have the ability to shiver. So it's important that they have this brown fat, but also that they're kept, you know, that's why, you know, newborn jars do full hats on their head, and they're obviously kept warm. Body temperature maintenance is, is really important. Brown fat in adults, uh, we don't see as much. Adults have very little brown fat, and so shimmer, shivering thermogenesis pretty much uh, takes over at that point. So normal responses vary. Again, body weight, distribution, um, hormone levels, all these things are going to impact you know, how we're able to regulate um, you know, our body temperature. For instance, people with a lot of adipose tissue, right, like an insulator, right? So people that are heavier that have more adipose tissue probably won't need to shiver less than people that don't have it as much, right? People that don't have as much um, you know, adipose tissue in their body probably going to have to shiver more, right? Because this adipose tissue can really act like something that's going to help insulate their body, okay? Um, again, temperature cycles can change, again, depending on many components and vary from, from person to person. Ovulation, of course, is going to, uh, in females, obviously going to cause change. And we'll look at that when we look at reproduction and development. The pyrexia is elevated body temperature. As a result of that, that's usually temporary uh, response. Fever is another um, you know, very significant component where we sort of see these pyrogens that stimulate the hypothalamus and temperature goes up. Um, and young children can get fever just from exercising in warm weather, but typically it's more associated, obviously, with some sort of illness as your body's immune system is trying to defend against that that has entered the system. So, uh, and we talked a little bit more about fever when we were looking at the um, lymphatic chapter. So, uh, so that pretty much wraps it up for um, this, this metabolic lecture. So um, this combined with digestion uh, will be the next exam coming up. So um, take a look at that. Make sure you're reading over the text, of course. Um, and just uh, let me know if you have questions about anything as we, as we move closer to that. All right?